Well, have you ever had buyer's remorse? It's that, that moment that you, you realize that the thing that you had built up in your mind, that you had hyped up, that it's going to be amazing when I finally uh, purchase this or when, when I finally reach this kind of goal, and then you, you have it and you go, this was not everything that I hoped it would be. You ever had that? Uh, I think the first time I really felt that, I was about nine years old, and I really wanted for Christmas um, something called moon shoes. Does anyone else remember moon shoes? I'm just curious. Did anyone in the room ever have some moon shoes? Okay. So you look at the advertisement here, okay? And if you're nine, you think, trampolines on your shoes? Do you know how amazing it would be? Like, you're just imagining yourself in the same way that you jump on a trampoline. You're bouncing everywhere. You're like, what if I had them on my feet? And it's going to be great. So, you know, built it up. I'm so excited about it. I'm, I mean, I'm imagining little nine-year-old Aaron Sanders. I'm thinking, man, I'm, as soon as I get it Christmas morning, I'm putting them on. I'm going on a driveway, slam dunk. You know, like, I, it's going to be amazing. And so I get the moon shoes. And basically, it's like, it's like wearing bricks on your feet. <laughs> it is the opposite. Now, because I'd hyped it up so much, I couldn't admit that I was disappointed in my gift. Uh, and in fact, I was like, oh, yeah, these are awesome. But internally, I'm going, oh, man, I wasted my Christmas present on these dumb moon shoes. <laughs> you ever had some moon shoes? You know what I'm saying? Like some, something in your life that you think, man, if I can just get to this, this um, point in my life, it's going to be great. And, and it may be a ma material possession, but it also may be something like uh, a relationship. You think, hey, if I can just be married or we can just have kids, man, it's going to be great. And then after you have kids, you're like, man, I can't wait for the empty nest. Won't that be great? Because these kids are overrated. Um, <laughs> My kids are like in the room, you know. <laughs> and, and then you get to a place where you think, man, if, if I can just retire, it's going to be great. And, and maybe retirement has been great for you. But, but, but sometimes people retire and they think, ah, I'm, I'm kind of bored. Now I, now I need to do something else. Like there, there are, we've all experienced times in our lives where we, we build up this hope for what the future is going to be like. And we think if we only have this, then, then I'm going to be happy, right? I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to have joy. And oftentimes, the things that we build up in our minds that we think are going to bring us that level of satisfaction and, and joy are actually the things that the world tells us um, are important. And, and advertisers are, are really good at that. Like, that's actually how, how they make their money, is they convince you that you just need this. Like, you, you, you've got to have it. Um, we were scrolling through Facebook the other night, and, and Holly showed me a picture. Uh, and it was one of those pillows that goes on a, a plane that goes in the seat in front of you, you kind of deal, like it, on, on the, the little table thing, and that you could just do that. And I thought, I need this. I don't know how I've lived my life. I'm 40 years old. How have I made it this far without that pillow? I've got to have that pillow. Like, that's what advertisers do. They, they make you think you, you just have to have it. And, and you know what? The people in the Bible um, were the same way. Today, we're going to look at a story uh, from the Old Testament. And, and actually, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel. Uh, and 1 Samuel really tells the story of ancient Israel in those early days as Israel transitioned from being a nation that was led by judges to a nation that was led uh, by kings. And, and it covers a lot of different ground. Um, and, and in fact, if you've ever had just an interest in, in seeing Israel, some of the, the, the places that you read about in 1 Samuel are places that we'll visit next year. I'm going to take a, a, a trip to Israel in November of next year. And so if you're interested in going, there's some brochures out in the foyer. But but Israel's in an amazing place, but the people there had some of the same faults that you and I do. That we could be easily distracted, that, that we could actually, instead of standing out the way God intended them to stand out, they would, they would sometimes say, actually, we want to be like the other nations. And God said, no, 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 you're my, you're my chosen people. You're supposed to be a light to the nations. You're, you're actually supposed to be very different from the nations, but sometimes they would look around and say, oh, we want what they have. 
And in 1 Samuel, this, this sense was that what we really need is a king. We're tired of having a very kind of loose system of governance with these they were called judges, and, and basically they were local military commanders, uh, but it was a very low, low level of, of kind of top-down government. And they said, what we really need is a king, someone who's going to rule over us like all the other nations. And the very last of the judges was a guy named Samuel, who was also a prophet, and he's He's talking to God about it and says, God, these people want a king, and I think that's a bad idea. And God says, yeah, I do think it's a bad idea. Um, but you know what? If that's what they want, let's give them what they ask for. And so he says, go and find the king. And that's where uh, the story picks up. So 1 Samuel, we're going to be uh, in chapter 9. And here's what, what happens. Samuel's looking for the next king. It says, there was a prominent man of Benjamin named Kish, and he had a son named Saul, an impressive young man, and there was no one more impressive among the Israelites than he. He stood a head taller than anyone else. So if you were a casting director for a movie, this is the guy that you would pick. I mean, Saul just looked like someone who should be in charge. He had a regal air to him. There was, he was probably handsome and strong. And he's the kind of guy that you think, man, if, if we need a dude to lead us into battle, this is the sort of guy. I mean, just an impressive physical specimen. Kind of like me. Um, <laughs> but Saul turned out not to be that great of a king. Uh, in fact, he was pretty brash, pretty arrogant, and oftentimes would, would take matters into his own hands. And even though he, he ruled for 40 years, he was almost always leading the people into battle. They were constantly having conflicts with the surrounding nations. And so the people thought that, hey, by having a king, all of our dreams will come cr true, and life is going to be so much better because we're going to have a king. And that turned out really not to be the case. And so eventually, Saul messes up so badly that God removes his hand of favor and leadership from Saul's life. And Samuel's still around, and he says, okay, we got to find the next guy. And so Samuel starts looking, uh, and that's where we're going to jump all the way to 1 Samuel 16, okay? So 1 Samuel 9 basically is the story of Saul, who is Israel's first king. And then when we pick up in, in chapter 16, uh, it's kind of toward the end of Saul's reign, and Samuel's now looking for Saul's replacement. And it says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul, since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, because I've selected for myself a king from his sons. Now, people in the Bible, by the way, didn't have last names. It wasn't like, hey, Jesse Smith. It was Jesse from Bethlehem. But oftentimes, uh, if, if they didn't necessarily know who they were, uh, where they were from, they, they'd mention who their dad was. And so uh, it, I'd be, you know, Aaron from Orange, but I'd also be Aaron, son of Allen, right? And you read that throughout the Bible. And in this case, Jesse is from Bethlehem, but his dad was a guy named Obed and Obed's dad was a guy named Boaz, who we studied last week. So Jesse is Boaz's grandson. Okay? And, and remember, it's, it's there in Bethlehem, literally the, the breadbasket of Israel. Uh, a lot of agriculture is happening there. But it's still a small, sleepy little town. It's not the sort of place that you would think uh, the next king would come from. So verse 4 says that Samuel did what the Lord directed and went to Bethlehem. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and said, Certainly the Lord's anointed one is here before him. Eliab was uh, the oldest son. And he probably looked something like what Saul looked like in his, his younger days. An impressive guy. And he says, man, surely this is the guy that's going to be the next king. But here's what the Lord says. Verse 7. But the, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance. Or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees. For humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. And that's such a great verse. In fact, if, if you're looking for a, a memory verse from today's sermon, like this would be a great one 
uh, to memorize. Now, the, the easy takeaway there is to think, hey, listen, we need to be the type of people who don't judge books by their cover. And I, I think that's completely true, right? Like so often we look at people's physical appearance or we, we think about their educational background or their socioeconomic status or just even their personality and the way they carry themselves. And we make judgments about their character based on how they are publicly representing themselves. And I think we have to be really careful about that because sometimes we, we judge people falsely, right? Like that, that happens all the time. And we certainly want, don't want to be judged that way. And so we should be careful about doing that to others. But I don't think that's actually the, the real meaning of that text. I think the scary thing, maybe for all of us, is that humanity looks on the outside, but God sees the heart. That means that you can fool all sorts of people. You can make people believe, man, that you have your act together and that you are godly and things are going well, but your heart can be in chaos and turmoil. And guess what? God sees it. God knows. So your family may not know, your friends may not know, your church may not know, but God knows because God sees the heart. And that's what God's looking at. By the way, like God, God is not impressed with our outward expressions of religion when our heart doesn't match up with the things that we say and do. He's just not impressed. Like we, we can do all sorts of amazing things. In, in fact, Jesus warns of, about that in the New Testament. He says, listen, there are going to be people at the, at the end of eternity who stand before God and they say, we did all these things. We did all this stuff. For you. And he says, depart from me. Because I knew you not. Like their heart wasn't in it. Their heart wasn't genuinely and authentically following the Lord. And so we need, to, we need to remember that, right? That God ultimately, our life should be an expression of what's inwardly happening. Like that, 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 that internal commitment to, to know and follow Jesus is manifesting itself out in the way that we live. So that's what God pays attention to. Not just our outward actions, but he's actually, he's he's listening to our heart. So Samuel met each one of Jesse's sons, but none of them um, were the right fit. And so verse 10 says that after Jesse presented seven of his sons to him, that's a lot of dudes, seven of the sons, Samuel told Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. And Samuel asked him, are these all the sons that you have? He says, there is still the youngest, he answered, but right now he's tending the sheep. Now this little verse means actually a couple things. One, it means that when Jesse found out that God's prophet was going to come and ordain one of his sons as the next king of Israel, that it didn't even cross his mind to go get the youngest. Like his assumption was, hey, it's going to be one of these, these seven older sons. But there's no way it's going to be David. So he can literally just stay out there with the sheep. Like there's no point in getting him. He can hang out with the sheep. So Jesse had no, no idea that, that it actually would be David. But also it gives us a glimpse into David's early life. He's a shepherd. And, and listen, being a shepherd is, is not a glamorous position. It wasn't, it wasn't back then, and, and it isn't now. I mean, it's, it's dirty. Uh, you're hanging out there with the animals, and they're, it's loud. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're blah, blah. I mean, it's just all the time. <laughs> and there's fleas and ticks, and, you know, and you're trying to get them to move around. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got to protect them. Because sheep don't have a lot of natural defenses. And so the predators in the wild, if they see a sheep, they're like, man, that is, that's lunch. And if you're a shepherd, one of your primary roles is not only to care for the sheep and provide them for them, but to protect them. And so David is getting this experience, um, really kind of a physical experience of, of actually fighting, 
of using his body and, and know what it's like to, to stand in the face of danger and, and to, to not panic, but, but to take action. And, and when you think about David's story, and some of you guys, man, if you grew up in church, you, you probably heard David's story, but David goes on to be one of the greatest warriors in the Bible. And a lot of those early skills, I think, were developed when he was, he's fending off predators. There's this story, actually, in the very next chapter um, of 1 Samuel, where um, the Philistine army, and the Philistines were Israel's kind of thorn in their side in this, this time period. Like, they were, they were the enemies. And the Philistine army had come, and they were basically challenging Israel to a fight. And Saul, remember, uh, the Bible says that Saul was a head taller than anyone else in Israel. Saul was like Israel's biggest dude, and he was king. And so Saul is, is, ought to be the guy who, who leads the troops out into battle, but across the way, they see this mega huge dude named Goliath, who was, who's literally a giant. And like if you go read um, like his proportions, if you read through that, like this, this dude is, he, he's humongous. He's Thanos. I mean, he's just a huge dude. He's so powerful, so strong. And so he's standing out in front of the Philistine army and, and really as almost a representative of the army saying, hey, I'm, I'm the Philistines champion. I'm the best of the best. I'm what the Philistines have to offer. Now you, Israel, you send out your best of the best and we'll just go one-on-one. Like, we'll just go one-on-one and, and see who wins. And nobody raises their hand in Israel. Like they see Goliath, they're like, nope. Anybody want to fight Goliath? Nope. And he just gets madder and madder. And he starts, he starts really cursing the name of the Lord and, and embarrassing them. I mean, just, just amazing amounts of trash talk. And, and day after day, anybody want to fight Goliath? Nope. And so they're, they're almost at this stalemate where nothing's happening. Well, David is, at this point, he's still the youngest son. He's, he's probably a teenager, and he wasn't allowed to join the army yet. And so his dad, Jesse, says, hey, listen, uh, all your older brothers are on the front lines of the battle. Um, I'm going to door dash some food to them. Why don't you bring it, okay? You're going to be the door dash driver. You go bring them lunch. And so David shows up, and he sees Goliath trash talking, and he is beside himself. He says, like, guys. Why are you allowing him to stand before um, the armies and, and say all these horrible things about the Lord and none of you are taking action? Like, why are you so scared? And here's where the story picks up. Verse 32, it says, David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, uh, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. And he's been a warrior since he was young. And here's what David says, okay? David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Can you just just pause for a second? He's talking about lions and bears. He says, listen, if they came, I would just, I'd just take care of it. I'd just grab that lion. I'd grab that bear. I mean, Davy Crockett got nothing on David from the Bible. It's an amazing thing. And then it says this. It says, your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, God used David's past experiences uh, as a shepherd to prepare him for his future role as a warrior and a general and a king. No doubt. That's that hand of providence that we talked about last week, that even in our circumstances, when we don't even understand what God is doing and, or why God may allow us to go through certain things, that, that actually God has a purpose and a plan behind all of that. And so he was preparing David 
in those fields, right? That's, it's not an accident. It's not a coincidence that David was there. That's part of God's providential plan. But here's what I want you to notice. Ultimately, David's confidence was not found in his own ability. It was because he had seen God's strength at work through him in the past. His confidence was not in himself. His confidence was in God. Yes, he knew he had been through some battles before he had been equipped, but his confidence came from the Lord. And later on, uh, David would become one of the most prolific uh, psalm writers. He, he was actually a bit of a musician and would play the harp. And uh, I think one of David's things, I mean, you can just imagine him out in the fields writing music and singing and praising God. And, and there's a psalm that, that David wrote, Psalm 20. And in verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In other words, he's saying, listen, you can put your hope in these physical things. You can put your hope in horses and chariots and resources and all these things. But my hope is found in him. That's where my confidence comes from. What about you? Where does your confidence come from? Because here's the deal. Um, even if I don't know you, I know that God has actually equipped you and prepared you for what he has planned for you. That God has actually always been at work in your life. Even before you even knew who he was. That you, you walked through circumstances providentially. That God made sure that you had a certain education. And it's no accident that you grew up where you grew up. Or the home that you grew up in. And so you've got experiences and educations. And he's also given you unique talents and uh, even spiritual gifts, if you became a, a follower of Jesus, we get these gifts from God. And so God has actually been preparing you and shaping you. And that ought to give you some, some confidence. But at the end of the day, we recognize that in our own strength, man, we're really not capable of a whole lot. But in him, when he's the one at work, then anything's possible. And so we want to find our confidence, not in ourselves but in Christ. And that's, that's David's story, is that um, he, as a young boy, when no one else was willing to stand up and raise their hands, he says, listen, I'll go fight him. And you can go back and read that story for homework. It's super cool, super, super cool story. All right, so, so Samuel shows up. He looks through Jesse's sons. He sees the oldest seven sons. None of them are the guy. And uh, Jesse says, well, I do have my youngest son, David, he's out there with a couple of sheep. Let me, let me call him in. Here's what happens. And the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. He's the guy. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. And you know what? David didn't become actually king. He didn't reign as king for, for many years later. But God used his life in just amazing ways. But as awesome as David is, can I tell you, there's a, there's a guy that, that came from Bethlehem that's even better than David. He's a true and better David that, that you know, David defeated a, a giant named Goliath. But Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he defeated sin and death when he died on the cross. David ran from King Saul's wrath. He would go and hide. But De Jesus didn't hide from the Father's wrath over sin. Instead, he endured the punishment for sin so that you and I can be forgiven. King David was a, very much an imperfect king who gave in to temptation. But Jesus is the perfect king who never sinned, who never gave in to temptation, and who rules and reigns in righteousness and holiness for all eternity. See, Scripture is, is super helpful for us. And as we read through Old Testament Scriptures, I, th I think that there's principles that we can learn and we can apply to our lives. And we get a glimpse of who God is, His nature and His character. But at the end of the day, all of Scripture points us to the person and the work of Jesus. Like, we read about David because God had a plan 
And he used David for that time period. But David is really just foreshadowing of a true and better king that would come. Listen, I don't know where you're at in your life this morning. Some of you are discouraged because you feel like David. And you're out with the sheep. And all you've got is just a little bit of responsibility. And you feel like, man, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. And I'm so discouraged. And I just want to encourage you, if you're in that moment, you have no clue what God is doing in you right now to prepare you for what he has ahead. And I believe, actually, that God is constantly doing that in us. That the things, even in my own life, that God is that I'm walking through, like God is actually going to use that even down the road for the sake of his glory. Others of you are here and, you know, when you think about people judging people based on their external appearances, you think, man, that's kind of like my story. And there's, there's really kind of two groups of people in the room. Some of you um, present yourself to be really um, capable and attractive people. I mean, we have some high-performing people in our church, high levels of education, um, really gifted, high emotional and relational IQ. And so uh, people around you just kind of assume that you've got your act together. But today you've been reminded that, listen, you can fool all these folks, but what God is looking at is your heart today. And maybe there's some things that need to happen in, in your heart that no one even knows about. And then others of you, maybe you're, you're not in that category. You're the, you're the kind of person that you feel like no one ever picks you for their kickball team. Like you're the, you're the person that, that gets overlooked. And maybe you're quiet and unassuming or you've got some physical limitations. And, and you just feel like, man, does anyone even see me? Can I encourage you this morning? God sees you. He sees your heart. And when man may look at the outward appearance, God sees. God sees your heart. And then some of you are, are maybe struggling to find contentment. And you have allowed the world to tell you what is important. And you've built that up in your mind. And you think, man, if I can only get here in my life, if I can only achieve these goals, then I'm going to be happy. That's what Israel thought. If we only had a king, if we were only like the other nations, then we're going to be good. Now listen, God's way is always the best way. And God's plan for Israel, his original design was not that they would have this earthly king, but that he would be their king. And that's what God wants for us. That we would allow him to be king because he is king. The question is, will we bow down? Will we lay down our crowns before him? So I want to give you some space this morning, just you and the Lord. If you don't mind, just bow your head. And I don't know what God may be doing in, in you, but as you think about this message, and you think about the scriptures we read, and what, what does it look like for you to respond? Maybe it's a, a response in humble submission. To say, God, I, I just confess, I've been so worried about that, the external appearances that the truth is my, my inner world is in turmoil and it is so far from you. And today you just need to come back to the Lord. Others of you just need to embrace the season that you're in. And you say, you know, this is not the season that uh, I would have hoped for and it's hard and difficult. But God, I trust that you are sovereign, that you have a plan, that nothing happens um, by happenstance, but actually providentially, God, you are preparing me for the work that you have. And maybe this morning you just kind of need to open your eyes and, and say, God, I, I submit to that. God, I want to be used by you. Teach me. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Help me understand what you're doing in me. Others of you just need to be reminded that our confidence comes not in our abilities or our education, our experience, or background. It comes from the Lord. And you may feel like, man, there is a giant in front of me. But God is so much bigger 
than any giant you may be facing. So place your trust in him. Place your, your confidence in him. Man, he alone brings victory. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the Lord. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful just for the opportunity to be here this morning, just to gather, to worship you. God, I pray that um, we would be not the kind of people who just hear the word and walk away unchanged, but God, that what we've heard today actually would lead us uh, to life change. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.